I've been using the new 14 inch MacBook Pro for over a month now. It's a great machine and a solid step up from the MacBook Air I had before it. I already gave some initial thoughts on the laptop and did a comparison to the Air, but here are my full thoughts now that I've really had some hands on time with it. Before I go into my thoughts on the laptop, I wanna get the specs out of the way so I can focus on the user experience. The 14 inch MacBook Pro starts off with the M2 Pro chip with a 10 core CPU and a 16 core GPU. It can be configured up to the M2 Max chip with a 12 core CPU and a 38 core GPU. On the RAM and storage side of things, it starts off with 16 gigabytes of RAM and is configurable up to 96, and the storage ranges from 512 gigabytes up to eight terabytes. The larger 16 inch version of the laptop has all those same configuration options, but a higher starting price of $24.99 compared to the 14 inch versions 1999. It also has more GPU cores on the base M2 Pro chip. Throughout most of the laptop, not much has changed from the previous generation. When the M1 chips first arrived for the MacBook Pro, the device saw a major redesign to strike a better balance of form and function. And that balance thankfully continues. Now, to focus on the user experience, I wanna start by talking about a use case that most people can relate to, content consumption so the screen and audio performance. The 14-inch MacBook Pro has a six-speaker array with force-canceling woofers, and they sound excellent. It has much better bass than the MacBook Air, and the proper speaker grades and ports provide good stereo separation to make for a surprisingly good music listening experience. Apple also talks about the Dolby Atmos and spatialized audio support with the speakers, but the laptop's built-in speakers definitely don't compare to the directionality and immersion you can get from a true surround setup. If you want good spatial audio with the laptop, you're better off using the HDMI out to get multi-channel audio or using AirPods. With modern AirPods, the 14-inch MacBook Pro supports not just spatialized audio, but head-tracked spatialized audio. This lets the direction the sound is coming from seem to stay in place even as you turn your head. It can be cool, especially with movies where sound is such an important part of the storytelling experience, so I understand why some people like to have that enabled. But for me, the extra processing done to emulate a surround sound experience doesn't lead to a sound that I prefer, and I even find the head tracked audio a bit jarring. Things like FaceTime using spatialized audio definitely seem more annoying than helpful for me. Thankfully, it is pretty easy to either disable head tracking or just disable spatialized audio altogether when you have your AirPods connected. I won't complain about extra features being available for those who want them, even if I won't find myself using them, because your experience with spatialized audio with AirPods could be different. Continuing with the media consumption experience, you have the screen. It may not be a 4K or 8K panel, but in a laptop of this size, that resolution isn't necessary anyway. The screen is 3024 by 1964 pixels for a total of 254 pixels per inch. Plenty for a screen of this size. But it is just a 14 inch screen. If you're in a dorm room and intend to use your laptop as one of your only content consumption devices, stepping up to the larger 16 inch screen could be worth it. To feel immersed in a movie like you would at a theater, you have to be pretty close to the screen, but you could find that worth the trade-offs as the MacBook Pro screen is very good. It's a mini LED type display. So unlike more typical LCDs, which have a backlight that illuminates the whole screen at once, it has thousands of tiny LEDs that can illuminate different sections of the screen, different amounts. This lets brighter elements on the screen get extra bright, up to 1600 nits with HDR content, while allowing dark elements on the screen to be darker. The whole screen max HDR brightness is 1000 nits, and with SDR content, it'll top out at 500. The high HDR brightness is great, as it lets light and bright objects really shine on the screen while still providing plenty of detail in darker scenes. This high brightness leads to a really good HDR experience, though not quite as good as some OLEDs. With the mini LED display, while each zone can adjust its backlight brightness, the zone is larger than the individual pixel. So if you have a very bright object on a dark background, you could see a bit of glow around that, which is referred to as bloom. 
When you're watching normal content, it's not noticeable. But if you're in a dark room with your brightness turned way up and you have white elements on a dark background, you can notice it. In my use though, the only times I saw the bloom was when I was specifically looking for it. As you can expect from Apple, the panel supports the wide P3 color space and True Tone to adjust the color temperature of the screen to match your environment so it won't look too blue or yellow for whatever lighting you have in your room. I personally prefer to keep True Tone off so the display's color remains consistent, but your mileage may vary. Additionally, the MacBook Pro has the variable refresh rate technology Apple refers to as ProMotion, so it supports refresh rates up to 120 Hz to offer a smoother experience when using the machine and allowing that refresh rate to match that of the content you're watching. Normally, if you're watching 24 FPS content, like movies, on a 60 Hz panel without variable refresh rate, it has to display one frame twice and the next frame three times in order to fit the 24 frames per second into the 60 Hz of the screen. The uneven amount of time each frame is displayed will result in judder. With this display, it can just run at 48 Hz so that each frame is displayed for an identical amount of time. This difference isn't something most people will notice, but if you're particularly susceptible to noticing it, the reduction in judder on the MacBook Pro's display is really nice to have. All in all, the MacBook Pro is an excellent content consumption device. The screen looks great and the speakers sound great with the biggest downside just being the size of the display. But it's what you'd expect from a laptop, and it has excellent portability, so it can hardly be considered a drawback. Now before we get into the next section, leave a like and let me know in the comments down below if you're enjoying the video so far. While most people consume content, being a pro laptop, plenty of people choose to upgrade to the MacBook Pro to produce content. So how does it hold up there? Pretty well. I've been doing all my video editing on the MacBook Pro, and it's done an excellent job. With Apple's M2 Pro chip inside, and a fantastic media engine that supports hardware acceleration for H.264, H.265, ProRes, and ProRes RAW, whatever media type you're working with, the laptop will handle it well. Even on the base spec, with a 512GB SSD and 16GB of RAM, I haven't had any major slowdowns. Only twice so far have I actually heard the fan ramp up to keep the chip cool while under a heavy load. And I work in Premiere, so people working with Apple's own Final Cut Pro may have better optimization and an even smoother experience due to that close integration. I've certainly considered giving Final Cut a try, but I haven't been able to make the jump quite yet. Now, when editing video or photos, color accuracy is pretty important. While by no means is the built-in display a reference monitor, it's plenty accurate for basic video and photo work with different profiles depending on the color space you're working in. If you're really worried about color accuracy, you can grab a calibration tool to adjust your built-in display and any external displays to match. The M2 Pro MacBook Pro also supports two external displays simultaneously. You can output 8K 60Hz or 4K 240Hz from the HDMI port or two 6K 60Hz streams from the Thunderbolt ports. If you choose to upgrade to the M2 Max chip, you can output to three displays at once for an even more impressive multi-monitor setup. I'm a big proponent to the value of multiple monitors, so the native support for more displays, as well as the HDMI port for higher resolutions and faster refresh rates, is really valuable to me. The power of the laptop and its excellent screen will make it a good fit for photo editing in Photoshop or Lightroom. I haven't experienced any issues or slowdowns in my time editing or exporting raw photos I've taken at rocket launches. Of course, a Pro machine will need to be powerful, so let's talk about its performance in some benchmarks. If you don't care about benchmark scores, I totally understand. Feel free to skip to here in the video to bypass all these numbers and just get on with the review. I started off with Geekbench. Geekbench runs a number of different tests, covering things from data compression and image processing to machine learning to get an overall idea of the everyday performance of the system. Running Geekbench 6 on the CPU, it gets a single core score of 2660 and a multi-core score of 12109. Comparing it to some other CPUs, that puts it roughly on par with the single core score of the Core i5-13600K or the Core i9-12900KS. Multi-core wise, it's closer to the Ryzen 5 7600 or the Core i5-12600KF. 
Of course, those processors were in desktop computers, and the M2 Pro is in a laptop and drawing far less power, but for the interest of the benchmarks, I'm just focusing on raw performance right now. Running a compute benchmark through Metal API, it gets 73,287, while running it through OpenCL gets a score of 43,209. Now you may notice the tests on screen don't exactly match the numbers I'm saying. That's just because I ran the tests without screen recording in order to get the most accurate results. And then I ran them again while recording in order to have something to show on screen. These scores may not beat out all the other CPUs and GPUs out there, but as with all things, it's a balance. Apple's ARM-based processor has a low power consumption and excellent efficiency, leading to excellent battery life. Now there is one way the performance on the 2023 MacBook Pro is actually a drop from the last generation, and that's the SSD. They doubled the capacity of the NAND modules, which sounds like a good thing, but because they didn't also upgrade the base storage to one terabyte, the base 512 gigabyte model now has just two NAND chips, while the previous generation had four. This leads to a decreased SSD speed from the M1 equivalent. Still, these speeds are good, all things considered. Blackmagic disk speed test shows a read speed around 3300 megabytes a second and a write speed of nearly 3000 megabytes a second. Since the base model has 16 gigabytes of RAM, unlike the MacBook Air, which starts out with just eight, you're far less likely to use swap and therefore less likely to notice any real world changes as a result of the slower SSD. Now, switching over to the Blender benchmark 3.4.0, which tests rendering and how fast the system can process samples. Testing the CPU cores on the M2 Pro chip led to a score of just 199.48, while running the test on the GPU, it received 657.07. The CPU performance was really close to that of the M1 Max. Finally, running Cinebench R23 with a multi-core test, the 14-inch MacBook Pro with the M2 Pro chip received 11,723, and in a single core test, it got 1,631. Not reaching the scores of Xeons and Threadrippers, but beating out the Core i5-11600KF and about on par with the Ryzen 5 5600X. Again, it's worth noting that it's competing against desktop class products here, and the power draw is just over 30 watts, while some of these competing products are drawing well over 100 watts. By the way, if you have any other benchmarks you'd be interested in, let me know in the comments below and I'll see about adding it to our list for all future reviews. All right, so I've covered content consumption and some more professional workloads now, but what about just general everyday use? As I've said before, the laptop carries over the design from the previous generation. When the 2021 MacBook Pro came out, it switched from a design focused wedge shape to a slightly more boxy shape that I think strikes a better balance of performance and style. The wider sides let Apple bring back some ports they had previously removed, and this new generation saw some improvements. On the left side, we've got the MagSafe 3 connector for charging up, two Thunderbolt ports, and a headphone jack with support for high impedance headphones. Over on the right side of the machine, there's a full-size SD card slot, another Thunderbolt port, and an HDMI 2.1 port. As I touched on previously, this upgrade to HDMI 2.1 brings higher resolutions and refresh rates, supporting up to 8K 60Hz or 4K 240Hz. While there are certainly other laptops that have more to offer in terms of ports, this is the first time in more than five years that I've had a laptop with an HDMI port and an SD card slot built in, and I am so glad to have them back. It seems minor, but it's one more adapter I'd have to keep track of. I already carry around an adapter for CFast cards and CF Express cards, so that's just one more thing I can leave at home. One negative from the identical design is the continued existence of a large notch for the 1080p FaceTime camera. The MacBook Pro still hasn't gained Face ID or other features to help justify the large cutout, but as I've said in some previous videos, once you start really using the machine, you basically forget it's there. The menu bar helps to hide it, the slightly taller aspect ratio prevents content from being covered by it. As far as the camera goes, an average person definitely won't run into any issues with it. It's perfectly adequate for video meetings or FaceTime calls, but a separate webcam or using your iPhone's camera through continuity camera will be a big step up in quality. The microphone on the laptop, however, is pretty outstanding. Apple refers to the 3-mic array as studio quality, 
and uses directional beamforming to get good, clear audio from the user while blocking out other nearby sounds. I've been really impressed with the microphone. It really does have a studio type sound to it, blocking out pretty much any of the room tone. This is the onboard audio from the MacBook Pro's array of microphones. Go ahead and let me know what you think in the comments down below. The keyboard continues what you'd expect from a MacBook keyboard. There isn't too much travel distance, and a mechanical keyboard certainly offers a more tactile experience, but as with so many things, there's a lot of personal choice in what makes a good keyboard. I like the typing experience on the MacBook Pro, and it's certainly much better than the butterfly keyboards Apple faced out a few years ago. I also quite like the styling of the black background behind the keys, rather than bare metal. The Touch ID built into the keyboard is also very handy to unlock the computer if for whatever reason I'm not wearing my Apple Watch. As I've mentioned throughout the review, the efficiency with Apple Silicon is fantastic, leading to excellent battery life. The 16-inch version will last even longer, but whether I was on a MacBook Air or a MacBook Pro, any of the laptops last long enough on battery that I don't have to think about bringing a charger with me when I'm leaving the home. I was gonna try to talk about gaming, but there really isn't too much to talk about. It isn't the power of the MacBook Pro holding it back, but the operating system. You can play Minecraft, League of Legends, and other games, but there's just no way to see Macs as gaming machines until more modern AAA games start supporting macOS. If you wanna play some retro games, you can always emulate the system, and older games could work if you're playing through a Windows virtual machine using software like Parallels, but Macs just don't compare to Windows machines or gaming consoles for the time being. Hopefully that will change. While I've stayed pretty focused on the M2 MacBook Pro here, of course it doesn't exist in a bubble. The MacBook Air, while less powerful and it has less connectivity, is still a great laptop and it packs a great punch for its size. And its base price is also $800 less expensive. If you think that could be a good option for you, check out my comparison video. The last generation MacBook Pro could also be a great option, especially if you're willing to go with a used laptop the M1 Pro or M1 Max MacBook Pro could be a fantastic value, outperforming the more modern M2 MacBook Air in the same form factor as the current MacBook Pro. But the M2 Pro MacBook Pro is the right laptop for me. I've enjoyed using it the past month, and it will continue to be my laptop going forward. I hope this video helped you out. If it did, consider leaving a like, leave your thoughts in the comments down below, and subscribe to the channel for more from 9to5Mac.